Welcome to the Undefined Podcast. I'm Jared Palmer. And I'm Ken Wheeler. And today on the podcast, we have a very special guest, purveyor of fake news and graphics editor at the New York Times, Rich Harris. What's up, Rich? That joke never gets old, Ken. No, it doesn't. <laughs> I can't even take the piss out of your job because we can't even talk about what you do. Yeah, yeah. I can't take the piss out of Jared's job because he works for the family business. So it'd be like insulting his mother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow, yeah. So <laughs> you, you're in an interesting so, position where you're the only one am, open to ridicule. All, we've been going for 30 seconds and I'm already being ganged up on. Yes. Welcome to the Undefined. <laughs> uh, thank you. It's good to be here. How are you doing today? I'm doing okay. Uh, you know, just uh, tending to the GitHub garden and, and whatnot. The GitHub garden. Tending to the heard. GitHub garden. That's an interesting way of putting it. Yeah. What I is your usual, how, 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 do, how do you tend? What is your, what is your, tell us about that. You, you have a lot of projects. So <laughs> it, what, how, do, how do you tend to them? It, erratically and badly, uh, I guess, is the short answer. Um, I'm not a very good open source maintainer of projects that I've sort of started to lose interest in. Um, <laughs> which is <laughs> a painful thing to admit this early on. What's that? There's that, there that blog post, I forgot who wrote it, about open source creators versus open source maintainers. And I think the thesis was that creating and maintaining are two different skills and they're not often in the same human being. I am the worst maintainer in world It's history. extremely true. I've, I've actually tried to make, a, like over the last couple of years, a really conscious effort to try and um, empower people uh, around me on projects to to make decisions and merge pull requests and update documentation and that sort of thing because uh, I just know that I'm terrible at it. Yeah, it's hard. I'm terrible at what you just described. <laughs> Heard that. <laughs> I give up. Um, so, fellas, so, I, yeah. I think it's time for a drink check. I think it is. Uh, the You're up, podcast. Bud. I'm uh, going with Grey Goose. Grey Goose today. Excellent Grey Goose choice. today uh, and uh, a little vodka soda action. Lovely. What about yourself, Sir Kenneth? Well, I'll tell you what. I, I saw you in the last couple podcasts drinking this Casamigo shit, and I said uh -huh. to myself, you know, well, what is this all about? So I picked up a bottle yesterday. You can see the back of it to see how busy I've been. I think oh, it's shit. very good. <laughs> I, I think it's lovely. How long, you hold, how long did you hold on to that bottle of that? Like? Uh, yeah, I got it on my birthday for the pregame. So that so my birthday was March 20, 20th. So yeah, about three weeks. People are like, oh yeah, man, you must have a sick liquor cabin. I was like, liquor does not have a fucking long shelf life in this household. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Rich? What are you working with? Uh, peppermint tea. Lovely. <laughs> I, I do have, for later, I do have um, some... Bacardi is it's like a special reserve bottle that the wife picked up in a trip to Puerto Rico a while back. Um, and it's pretty good. Nice. Wow. Peppermint tea. The high end rum is great. Dude, is that a fucking it mug is. of you? <laughs> it actually is a mug of me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you have a mug with a cartoon face oh, of yours on it. It's a, it's a good eye. Um, yeah, when I was working at The Guardian, I was part of a team um, of interactive visual journalists. Uh, and a lot of the pieces that we did included these little 8-bit characters. And so when we all got laid off, we made ceremonial mugs of ourselves um, so that we could relive the, the glory days forever. Nice. When was that? That was uh, two years ago. And then you moved to the Times. And so you, the Times. so tell us a little about what you do at the Times. Cause I, it's, do you, you, do you classify yourself as a developer even in your, like not, not in your job title, right? Not in my job title. My job title is graphics editor, which is, is pretty uh, wide ranging in terms of the responsibilities that it, it, it describes. Um, people with that job title all span the gamut from uh, reporter to designer, to developer, to, you know, 3D modeler to architect to map maker, all of these kinds of things. So it, it's, it's a pretty loose term. In my case, I'm the, the sole graphics editor on the investigations team, which means that um, 
Sometimes I'm building interactive visualizations of data that belong in an investigative story. Sometimes I'm building databases, um, helping other journalists find things out. Um, it really depends on the day. Are you technically a journalist? Uh, I mean, there's, there's no formal qualification for, for journalism, but yeah. You're definitely, it's, wow. It's, wow. It's, it's a, it's a journalism job. Yeah. So the, 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 you know, the stuff that you work on, um, do you do any of that at work? Sometimes. Yeah. If, if it's relevant to the, to the project at hand, like for example, at the moment, um, I'm trying to do some WebGL stuff inside Svelte and that's because it would be useful for a story that's going to be coming out in, in a few weeks. And so um, it makes sense to invest that time into doing it in a reusable way. So next time we're going to need to do some WebGL stuff. There's a ready-made library, um, but Amazing. mostly it's evenings and weekends. Wow. Hmm. So I got to so, say with Swell, with Svelte, yeah. Svelte, Swell, Korea, Swell. Yeah. Yeah, the, the code name. Uh, with Svelte, it seems perfect for writing interactive articles. Um, or like a great tool for that, I should say, you know, it's gonna, but could you just talk about how like that, or, or do you write, I mean, I assume you write your interact, some of your interactive articles with, with, with Svelte or yeah, yeah, it seems do. like a really um, good use case for it. It is. I mean, that, that's where it came from. So that Svelte is actually my second attempt to, to build a framework for this stuff. Uh, if you count Svelte one and two as a different project, which it almost is, then I guess it's my third attempt. And the reason for that is when I came into this line of work a few years ago, the tools that were available just weren't good enough um, for rapidly building high performance interactives when you've got a lot of data, a lot of animation, stuff like that. And so, um, so I, I built a thing back then called, called Reactive, which was superseded by Svelte One uh, like three years ago, two and a half years ago. Um, and then I've just been iterating on that same idea ever since. It, it's all basically so that I have the tools that I need to do my job. But it turns out that if you build tools that make it possible to build that kind of stuff, then it's useful in a lot of other scenarios because a, a news interactive is quite a high pressure sort of stress test for any web technology. How long have you been doing this shit? You mean programming? Yeah. Uh, I guess since 2011 is probably when I started writing JavaScript. So nice. A, a while now. And you, you never formally schooled in it, just rocked with it? Never formally schooled, no. Uh, my background's always been in journalism. Um, and there came a point where, like as much for preservation of my employability as anything else, I, I thought I've got to learn how to do this shit. And I had some people who took me under their wing and sort of showed me, oh, there's this thing called jQuery, which you can use. Um, and from there, just try to build stuff. You really knocked that shit out of the park. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus you. fucking Christ. So, so roll up and sl roll up is seems also along the same lines, like seems perfect for building what you, it's what you want for if you're just building a single article but also yeah. or a library, but it makes a lot of sense for a single article. Uh, yeah. So is yeah, Svelte the blessed thing there? Uh, not, not as such, no. I mean, the nytimes.com is built with React. They just finished a big rewrite that started a while back. Um, we've used it for a few different interactive graphics, but you know, people who work in a newsroom as coders, they're very often more comfortable with things like D3 and jQuery and underscore and, you know, that classic set of tools. And I've got no intention of wading in and saying, no, you should use this stuff instead now. So when you go to make an interactive, is it just a, it just starts with bare bones static HTML and you can use whatever artisanal tools you want to, or is that, is that the, like the slash interact New York NY times.com slash interactive slash that is whatever you want. Whatever. Up to a point. Yeah. Um, th there are ways of, of doing whatever you want, but we, we have, you know, you have to tie everything that we build into our content management system, which requires jumping through some hoops. So we have a project template and it's not as flexible as just, you know, make the, my project 
um, npm install webpack. Yeah. Like, there's, there's a bit more to it than that. That makes sense. What is the CMS built in? Does that also React? I believe so. Yeah. Fancy, fancy React's shit. Everywhere. Do you ever, you're ever like, all right, we're going to use felt on this one. And then somebody's like, man, fuck's felt like internally. <laughs> uh, not yet. No. Um, the, the only time I've worked on a big project with other people using felt, it wasn't my choice to use felt. It was uh, one of my colleagues. We were building this, um, this big feature for the midterm elections last year. Um, it was this crazy project. They, they decided that they were going to phone up like a million U S voters and see who they were going to be voting for in various elections. And then they displayed that information real time for all of these different races night after night. And they called like 2 million people in the end and building that application in a way that was, uh, you know, it could be baked out as a server rendered thing, but also was pulling in live information and had different pages for all of these different races and also could be, put inside our content management system. They chose to use Svelte for that. And as they got near the deadline, it was like, oh, Rich, uh, how do we do this thing? And so I, I got involved um, at that point. But that's the only time, um, actually, no, that's not true. There have been a couple of times when I've, I've worked on projects with other graphics editors that have involved Svelte. And so far, touch wood, there hasn't been too much resistance. So like every time I have had a thing that I've built, and it gets used internally, right? Outside of actually building that thing, right? If anything's wrong, right? It's just like, You're on the hey, hook. motherfucker. <laughs> you, know, so you get that, like, all the day come up and they're like, hey, like they're up in your yeah. shit. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. Yeah, you're like, you're putting what? yourself in the line when you do that. You're kind of like, ah, shit. But at the same sense, you know, it's, it's cool because you can resolve But that is just open source, like, more broadly, right? If you, if you make something and you're like, hey, this is useful, I'm going to put it on GitHub and share it with the rest of the world. Maybe you'll find it useful too. Then the very next day, you'll have some joker up in your mention saying, well, this is stupid. It doesn't work. Help me fix it. Or like use my project that's shittier, but also on the same, trying to solve the same thing. <laughs> yeah. So you got all that it. poll data, right? Yeah. So you take the data and you end up with a visualization, you know, an interactive, right? At what point does the algorithm take place that skews the data leftwards? <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious. Oh my God. You're going to get me fired, aren't you? I'm just fucking with you. No, but I'm, I'm interested, um, you know, like uh, w from, from raw data to interactive, it's, that's, that's, that's your your wheelhouse there pretty much there's a big team of graphics editors there's also a big team called the interactive news team which is responsible for building out the infrastructure that allows us to handle these vast quantities of data like on a, on a big election night for example we could have hundreds of thousands of people on the site concurrently and there needs to be a way to serve live updates to all of those people um, and you need people who know what they're doing. So what percentage of your day-to-day -day is writing like put patch and post requests? <laughs> is it really just reads for, for most of the... For most of it, yeah. Yeah, that must be a fun place to be. Dude, it, it's the best place to be an engineer, like period. We don't have to maintain products. We don't have to <laughs> worry about existing architectural patterns or any of that, right? You've got four weeks to build something and you can try out whatever new techniques you've been interested in. You can rack up as much technical debt as you can manage. And then at the end of it, you publish it. Job's done. Off you it's go. over with. There's yeah. no 2.0. There's no 2.0. I so, mean, sometimes there is. Like you, you want to reuse ideas that have been successful in the past. If you come up with a really good chart form that you want to reuse, then sometimes you might want to turn that into a reusable thing. But by and large, you're free of the responsibility of maintaining things over a long period of time. Like maybe you'd want to correct the record on something <laughs> like that might be like an update. Like if there were any reason why you, you, you found that maybe the data was false, <laughs> you would stop, you'd make it. <laughs> no, I'm not, <laughs> no, not going to stop. <laughs> <laughs>
It's <laughs> too funny. Do your do your bosses know like uh like what you like you, you do? Like are they aware? My editor, uh, he, he's actually a very um, technically literate guy. His background is in computer science and multimedia journalism. Um, he's the guy that hired me. We worked together at The Guardian before that. In fact, he's the guy who brought me to the US in the first place. So he and I go back away and, and he, he knows what kind of work I do. Um, the company as a whole is, is very aware of what its graphics people are, are doing and like the kinds of hours that they're putting in and, and the they know you're you know, a prolific the, the bastard. technical barriers that I like to think so. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. That's good. They, 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 they treat us, um, you know, a lot of news organizations, maybe less so nowadays, but there certainly was a time when graphics people were treated as kind of a service desk. Like you go to them with, here's a story. We need you to make a picture for it. Right. Um, but at the New York times, graphics people are, are treated with a lot of respect, which is really nice. Like they're very much part of the, um, the editorial process. They're involved in the reporting, and now you actually had your own story, right? Like I saw something where you were on the news, like you were like it was like video. Yeah, I was, I was on Good Morning America, which was fucking terrifying. Expl- Tell me about that? that one. Yeah, what was that like? It was all right. So we published this story. It was a story about um, the celebrities who buy fake Twitter followers to make themselves look more influential than they are. Yep. And politicians tell all these people too, like a lot of people buying fake influence. And it, it turned out to be like a really successful story. And on the, on the Sunday after we'd published it, and none of us had really slept very much, like we'd been working full on to get this thing out of the door. Um, all of a sudden, we got, started getting media requests and someone wanted one of us, one of the byline people to go on Good Morning America. Um, and I, I pulled the short straw. And so I, I was put in a taxi, sent to somewhere in, in, uh, in midtown Manhattan and sat in this horrible airless room with a very bright light shining in my face while a producer who had just been handed some notes by her colleague about what this story was asked some completely irrelevant questions and I had to sit there and try and not talk absolute bullshit for 45 minutes. And then at the end of it, they, they kind of take the 30 usable seconds of, of where you weren't just umming and ahhing and, and and blinking and looking at the camera <laughs> and, and work it into a segment that appears on the news the next day. I hate that so much where you'll record like two hours of video for something. Right? What, like this and podcast? Then, like, no, like this podcast like goes like, no, 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 no. Like, oh, no. Cut, right? This goes straight through, right? This is, this well, is now, very now, start now, to finish. Yes, now, now yeah. that we're doing the video thing. Yeah, but I mean, it's, it's, it's generally speaking linear, right? Mm-hmm. But when you have like two hours of shit and they, they do like a, like a four minute cut, Right, like anything, like like the the things that you look back and you're like, oh, I hope they don't fucking run with that. That's exactly <laughs> what they run with Always. every single Always. fucking time. That's the good stuff. Yeah. Um, like, oh, that art that article was amazing, by the way. Thank uh, you from a from a both like content and also perspective. And super funny is I know I knew one of the people that was in one of the categories on the. <laughs> oh, who was it? I don't want to say their name, but maybe I just it, it was, it was, it was, it was like. We like Nicole, Nicole Lapin, Lapine. She was like top, top of that, like influencer one. She's like, the, right, she's right, a lady right. who does like the boss bitch. Um, she's the author who does that. I met her like through a friend of a friend. Um, and I was like, oh shit, Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's very common among influencers to do that sort of thing. Well, the, so. Because it's I, currency, right? Right. It's currency, but it's so easy to kind of spot. I don't know. Now I'm just like, when I see someone with like, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000 followers. And then you see that they get 200 likes on a post. You're like, what? Yeah, uh, they don't have the engagement. Right. So I think, it, I think I read a stat somewhere where it's around 5%. Anything above 5% is good. Mm. Uh, and so if that number's dramatically lower, then something fishy's going on. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. But I mean, yeah, it's currency for a certain in a certain world, um, which is crazy. Even in our world, it's currency, right? Like GitHub stars, man. I guess. Yeah. Do people do people buy GitHub stars? You can't buy GitHub stars. If not, if not, there's a startup idea right there. That's a billion dollar idea. <laughs> I don't know about billion. It's like dollars. a twenty four thousand dollar idea. <laughs> I was say it's like a cool <laughs> HN top 
top of HN and then nothing. If you really wanted to get some shit boosted at the top of HN, you could fucking totally do that. But then you have to deal with it being at the top of HN. Yeah, it's like, I don't understand why you would do that to yourself, right? Like, yeah. if, like I guess your project will get popular, but... Have yeah, you ever you, been on the front page? Torn. Can? Yeah, fuck yeah, a, a number of occasions. Uh, really? Yeah, you just get torn the fuck apart. Ooh, I actually have never been on the front page of Hacker News. No ma- Formic, nope, nothing, never. And I really? posted shit, and it's never bubbled up. I don't know. Weird. And then I see, like, a, a Zite thing, and it's, like, Next.js, it's like, that we got 500 upvotes. I'm just like, what? Just be careful what you wish for. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, no, I, uh, that, yeah, that's, that's, that's true. So Svelte 3, what was, uh, what was the thinking there? Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, thinking was, um, I was atoning for my mistakes, my design mistakes. Um, so 1 and 2 were kind of inherited from this earlier framework that I told you about, Reactive, which had started designing when I was very, very wet behind the ears and really didn't know what I was doing. Um, this whole idea of having like a default export with a components object and you uh, like register your components on this and then you have a, a data function which returns some data which becomes like visible to the template, all of this stuff. Dude, I love that you didn't do that, by the way. Well, but, but I did. I did in Reactive and I did in Svelte. No, but not, it's in the latest version. Like I love that you don't right. have to register. To like I said this to Ken, the first thing I said to him in our DM was like, yo, he fixed it. Like I never understood an angular or a view why I imported this thing just already. Why can't I just use it? Why do I have to register it again? It, it's implementation details poking through and showing themselves up in the API. That's all it is. Um, but this time around, we, we very consciously decided that we were going to get the API right first and then worry about the implementation details, which is the way that you should build anything. Um, and you know, I'd been thinking about the problem for a while and I started to, see ways in which it could be done. The real breakthrough was this idea that you can put reactivity into the language instead of having a component API where you do set state or, or anything like that. That is the thing that kind of frees the API up because at that point, you don't need to start registering things and exposing them to the template. It's all just kind of naturally falls out of the way that you would idiomatically write code. I like that. I have to say it is one of my as a component library author, and just day-to-day user of React, there are times when registration is required and it's really frustrating. You can't register children with parents and you can't, and, and yes, you can go down the tree very easily, imperatively, but the inability to register children with parents or just like register when things have arrived yeah. and coordination is a challenge. Uh, I mean, Ken, you, you deal with that every single day. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, and uh, it's a bitch. And I got to say some of the new primitives in react don't make it any easier. They don't even address it. It's not an addressed issue. Some shit like, I don't know, dude, like one of the talks that I'm going to probably give in the next year is when to not use react, when to bail the fuck out. Um, yeah. Because it's, it's, it's probably more often than you think. Um, you know, it covers most of shit, but I mean, if you're doing anything really ambitious, there's a lot of places where you could bail the fuck out and just go natty and you'd be okay. You'd be better off. It's interesting because I think the React Native, like the, the React Native community is a lot more, because they have to be willing and able to bail and yeah. bind back. Um, yeah. Right? I, I think it's interesting that there are massive applications that jump through so many, like somebody was, uh, was saying on Twitter that they had a hundred field form and Formic wasn't performant for that. And I was like, I didn't design it for this. And React, by the way, would suck at that too. Why do you have a hundred field form? I, I, that was beyond me, but um, React Why, why are there a hundred mini horses? <laughs> I don't know, but I, I think you're right. I think people should bail to the DOM or something else more often. Well, like I, that's the whole thing with like forms. Like I, like I know like a lot of people who do that whole like Redux, like put every fucking field in Redux controlled thing. And uh, I was never really into that. Like, like you could just do a, a submit and get all that shit. <laughs> you know, like yeah, for a while. It depends on the app, but yeah, uncontrolled inputs are totally valid. Um, yeah, I mean, so you, you say that people should bail out and use the escape patches more often, but the whole point of using a component framework is so that you don't need to do that. Correct. And, and if you're finding yourself in a situation where you need to use the escape hatches to, just to do your job, then it, it's, it's a sign that 
the the fundamentals aren't there. Well, I mean, it would still be wrapped in a in a parent component, right? That that handles getting the data and shit like that. But like, rather than this elaborate like children tree, right? Mm. In that parent component, like that's where you're going to do your like D three, for example. Yeah, I th- I think it's again about you're right. The the framework should handle it. And for the common folk, they should only ever have to deal with that. But potentially for certain situations, it. I, I think I think Kevin, your point was that like people are myopic about the framework, right? And they should be because that's what the that's what the contract is. The contract of a framework is you can use this. Well, ideally, it's you can just use this and everything can be done, right? But I don't think necessarily React or I don't know maybe Vue too is good about telling you what it can't do or what it's not good at and when to bail. Um, perhaps that should be a new page in the docs. I think this is maybe the main point of, of distinction between, um, sorry, the main point of disagreement between people who would say you should use React and people who say you should use something like Svelte is, is just about where that point is at which you're asking too much of the framework. Um, you know, people in the React community will often say, oh, it's perfectly fine, it's performant enough because we're not reaching that point. And my response is I reach that point routinely. And it kind of just depends on the kind of work that you're doing and, you know, the users that you have. Yeah. I mean, like it's, it's easy for Tommy to do list to say fucking, you know, it's fine. But a lot of the time, like if you, if you're, you know, again, the, the more ambitious shit you're trying to do, the more you're going to hit the edges of the capability. And um, it's frustrating. And it's not just React. I hit the edges of browsers all the time. And that's frustrating too. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, worse because... There's nothing you can fucking do about it. it. Yeah. Except, you know, do everything in WebGL. Slide of hand. Yeah. Um, it's coming along, dude. It's like I'm waiting for the accessibility shit. And the text selection is, is iffy. That's interesting. I mean, I, I wouldn't wish implementing text selection in WebGL on anyone. I'm, yeah. Like, I'm, I'm trying to think like, you know, how much I actually want it to do. Right. Cause like if you want it to do everything, it's not going to get done. And it's like, when, what's like the, how did, how, how, how did Flipboard in react canvas implement um, text selection or they just, they didn't, I don't think so. Hmm. No, I'm so, pissed that project got, got so much hate and fell off and just stopped. Cause yeah, I, I mean, it was a fun experiment. I mean, like, so they, they did like box primitives, right. Which is like, yeah essentially the same fucking thing that I'm doing, except um, I'm using the React Native API, right? I'm using view and text. Mm-hmm. Um, but the difference is that they had, uh, they didn't have layout helpers, right? Uh-huh. So everything, everything in Canvas is like X, Y, width and height, which is like a huge pain in the ass. It's like, if you like built a website with absolute positioning and then like- It would be like Framer, like it'd be like, it'd be great for prototyping and nothing else. Yeah, so like I, I, I put yoga into the mix to, uh, you know, make it, productive which is cool right but there, there's 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 so much to do and you know even then like i'm still so I'm, I'm starting to hit like perf problems with like the actual overhead of components themselves you, you mentioned that last podcast you mentioned that you literally the extra function calls yeah you were becoming problematic how did you measure that you just looked at the profiler and you just noticed that like, yeah yeah, so that's the other thing too with that, like this person who asked me that, how do I, how do I make this 100, 100 field form performance? I was like, don't use context, stay in one component, put everything like in one place, uh, in one big ass function. You'll have the fastest th- updates you possibly can. Yep. Don't use spread, pass everything directly. Like, <laughs> yep. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's not a fun situation. And to risk rich your point, man, it's like, uh, those are the boundaries and they kind of suck. From a developer experience perspective, now I guess how do you, Rich? I'm interested to hear your take on what you're willing to trade off from a developer experience perspective for the best, I guess, performance. Are you like easily? Are you always going to decide on performance, or like where, where's your trade off sort of boundary point there? Or really, how do you think about that that, that trade off? I, I mean, I, I think our responsibility is to users first and foremost. Like I think it's even written into some specification somewhere. I prefer end users over um, developers, over you know, browser implementers or whatever it is, um, over spec authors. Like the user comes first. And so if there is 
a, a conflict between those things, then you, you've got to side with, with the user. Our job is to be advocates for the user. At the same time, the, the reason that I'm so enthused about the Svelte approach is that it kind of frees you from a lot of those decisions to a large extent because you can have a good developer experience and a good user experience by shifting the work into a compile step. It's not like you're having to choose between um, writing grotesque code and doing grotesque things with your beautiful declarative code at runtime because you can do a lot of that work um, and it never even hits the browser. And, and with, the, with the compiler um, for Svelte, what sort of led you down that path initially, or that was back into Ra or was that baked into Reactive? Like that started you down that path. I, I wasn't. No, I mean, Ra Ra Reactive had some kind of pre-processing. Like it would take your string templates and it would turn it into a, an abstract syntax tree, and then you could just deliver that as a blob of JSON, and it would be like pre-optimized. But it was still, um, you know, a fairly memory-intensive key-value observation mechanism, um, which you know, we all know has, has some pretty severe flaws. I'd, I've been kind of tinkering around in the compiler space for a while. Like Rollup has some compiler smarts in it. And I built a, a thing called Buble, which is like, like Babel 5 was before Babel 6 came on. It was purely responsible for turning ES6 into ES5. Um, so I'd, I'd kind of developed a bit of a sense of what the possibilities were. And... And then I had a conversation with Jed Schmidt uh, one night where he was talking about some thinking that he'd been doing on this topic. He said something like, you know, wouldn't it be great if uh, a compiler analyzed the shape of your application and generated the imperative code for you? Like if the framework wasn't a thing that you actually shipped with your app. And it took me a long time to understand what he meant by that. But once I did, like I wrote the first version of Svelte in about four days because I was Whoa. so excited. Wow. That's rowdy as fuck. Yeah, but it, you know, it took me a long time to, to kind of get there and to develop any kind of a concept of what this thing would be. <clears throat> what was the prior art? What did you study when, b before taking that on when you were doing your, your uh, hammock architecture? You know, I, I'm not very well read about this stuff. Like I, I learned the most from reading source code. Or if like you, you familiar with PEG.js, this parser expression grammar.js, I think it's called, um, where you, you give it a grammar and it will give you back uh, a JavaScript function which would parse a text in that grammar. Um, and so I would just like play around with that and see what the, the parser would generate and then try and figure out how to, how to do that in a more optimal hand-coded way to generate an abstract syntax tree out of a single file component, for example. Um, also just like being aware of packages like Acorn and CSS tree, which can parse JavaScript and, and CSS. And just kind of bolting these things together and playing around with it until something happens. Yeah, that's wild. That is wild. But that's great because like it's totally original and that's, you know, there's, there's something to be read. I'm probably doing a bunch of things very wrong. But, but it works, so who cares? It, it works, yeah. It fucking works, man. Uh, it fucking works and uh, pays the bills. So that's, that's what matters, right? Um, I, do like, I do like thinking of, I, I kind of wish that, remember that React Future um, repo? Yeah. That was a great repo. I feel like that was a, that was a great time. But what was your jam off of there? Um, I don't know. I'm always irked that like JSX2 never really got fixed or just... There's some in the React stuff, you know. Using it day to day, there are parts that I guess I'm so used to them now that I just know that they're not going to get, they're not going to change. Um, you know, shorthand properties and J, like just JSX, I guess for me is just a little wax sauce and needs needs an updating. Um, for and especially seeing like Reason and how that is handled there. Not that I'm opting for calling it like Reason React dot string or whatever, what, like that's not for me. But but you know, just seeing what's possible, I guess. And also seeing, you know, how, um, like for example, in Svelte 3, the transition API, like everything about animation is baked in and that's how it should be in React and it's just not at all. Like CSS transition group, in my opinion, should be part of React DOM. 
and built in and be like a primitive thing. Yeah, uh, well, you, you want you want a lot more shit in React. I'm all about removing my dumbass from remembering it because every I, I don't know anybody on my team that doesn't look up the docs for CSS transition group every time they use it. And in my opinion, flip um, for the same reasons that we all use Create React app to spin up a new project. That shit should be offloaded to the framework to make it performant and optimized so that everybody gets these super awesome updates when they release a new version of it. Um, it shouldn't, uh, yeah, that's just my hot take. I think that React DOM should have more primitives um, baked into it so that people don't have to, or they, they, they make the right choice more often. Um, and I think things like animations are terrible in, to be fair, like they're good, they're, they're better in view, but they're still not great either. Um, but I love how Svelte has it as a first class citizen. What if I told I mean, you the problem is the browser? The that I do. Well, there's that too, but 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 I'm not gonna change that anytime soon. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> Ken's fuming. <laughs> yeah. I fucking hate web browsers so goddamn much. It's it's a terrible profession we've all chosen. <laughs> yeah, no, it's good. It's good. No, you know. Like, uh, like, like, uh, it's, it's not like, uh, like I just hate it. It's like, it's, you just see the potential and it's like not living up to its potential. You know, you have like this, like, it's like a nephew that got like your perfect score on the SATs, but he's out there playing guitar, smoking weed. You're like, Hey, knucklehead <laughs> fucking <laughs> pull your shit together. Oh my gosh. Dude, I guess I'm, I'm less down on browsers than, than you are. I, I think modern browsers are, Kind of miraculous. Well, yeah, they are, but they're still. Uh, how do I put this? Um, not suitable for application development. Right, you're pushing it there, you know, and if you're making a document, right, they're fucking phenomenal, right. But if you're making like an app that would be like, that would have like an analog, like on like the desktop or on a phone, like a like a fucking app. Right, like they, it's just it's just watered down, right? It's like uh... I don't know. I mean, I, I use VS Code and I use Spotify all the time, and those are very nice applications to use. I know people bitch about Electron, but I think they they're great. They're as good as any of the native apps that I use. They're a, a lot better than like the Adobe products that I use. They're they're awful. Those are native applications yeah. which are literally unusable compared to that there are examples of Electron apps that are actually extremely good. And the web is just Electron without the node part. That's a big fucking think, difference. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's different in so far as you, uh, you have to jump through a lot more hoops to get data onto the page and all of that stuff. But in terms of what you're technically capable of, they're pretty similar. Yeah, like I like Electron shit. I do. I've, I've made a, a bunch of Electron apps. And that that node escape hatch there, um, that that satisfies a lot of the the things that I would need to make actual apps, right? I'm a little concerned that we we talk down the web in such a way that it'll become a self fulfilling prophecy. Like if the web fails and cedes more ground to native, like we'll bear some of the responsibility for 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 not you know believing that this is a platform that has a potential to do everything that we want out of native apps. Yeah. So what are, yeah. What are your favorite apps these days though? Rich, I'm curious. Like what, what do you, what do you, what do you, what do you think of as the, your favorite apps for whatever reasons? Like what, what, what do you ask that question? Uh, well, things that I use on a regular basis. Uh, I mean, I'm in Slack all day at work. Um, I wouldn't say that I love it. I'm in Gmail as well, which is a very bad example of what I'm trying to talk about. Um, workflowy. This is a good one. This is a like a, a productivity app that I use a lot. It's very good. Um, the Google Doc Suite is pretty great. I think. I would tend to agree. I would agree with that. And little, yeah, it, it comes up a lot. But mobile.twitter.com. Like I don't go to twitter.com anymore. I go to mobile.twitter.com, and and that's a pretty decent experience there's some bugginess there's some weirdness but on the whole that's a pretty satisfying do you use the app on your phone no no i, I use the pwa on my phone i have the native app installed but only because the pwa doesn't support multiple accounts 
Interesting. Are you are you iPhone or Android? Android. Okay, that makes sense. Um, just because the login doesn't really persist on iPhone. Uh, or the, sorry, you're, the the one thing that's annoying about the PWA is it doesn't preserve at least last time I checked. I, mean, I don't know if the Android and, and iOS won't preserve the plate your your um, the screen that you're on uh, between two opens. So that's really frustrating. Uh, that's true. But uh, I mean, yeah, I mean that's definitely best of the best of breed. Uh, so and I've got to imagine that they've got way more people working on the native app than on the web app. Like it seemed like 15 people or so, I think, working on the web app. They must have more than that working on native. Interesting. I speak yeah, without yeah. any knowledge whatsoever. <laughs> um, so we go on to meme of the week, Ken? You got a meme yeah. of the week? Um, I do. Wait, is it meme of the week now? It's, it's meme of the week or it's tweet, tweet, tweet of the week. Tweet of the week. Tweet. All right. All right. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm, is, it, is, it, is it fucked up to do my own? It's not fucked up. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, there were there were some good memes this week, but I can't remember any of them. But um, it was uh, it was it was May the Fourth day when all those fucking nerds get really excited about Star Wars. Um, and I was thinking of a way that I could make fun of them for liking Star Wars, as you do. Mm-hmm. And it just popped into my head that I was like, May the Fourth, May the Fourth, and then I realized so. Uh, I, and, and Rich, you like this because you're Brits. Uh, you do like the, what is it, the the day, month, year? <laughs> the 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 proper way, yeah. 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 No, so every was, other fucking country <laughs> de- decided to write dates. I was not, like, not good enough. I, United I was States. like, Europe, Europe, be like, for the mate, be with you. <laughs> <laughs> and I really enjoyed that. That's good shit. Yeah, I thought that I thought that was kind of clever and you know kind of <laughs> I like to fuck with the rest of the world on from time to time. I really do. Yeah, uh, we've noticed. Yeah. Well All you're right. American now. I have a green card. Are you eventually gonna become a full fledged American? Maybe. I haven't decided yet. We should uh, totally throw a party. If you do, we um, should throw a fucking should do the induction ceremony in my backyard. <laughs> That's about to say. <laughs> I I'll think I've got a, pork. a green card holder for like five years before you can even apply for citizenship. So really, it, yeah, it's it, it's a whole process. Even getting the green card is is a long winded process. You mean to tell me there's nobody who you've you know maybe bended media truths for who could make that happen for you <laughs> a little bit quicker? Wait, you, you you think that the U.S. government likes us? <laughs> I'm, I mean, not the current one. I mean, you know, there's there's a couple of factions in play. <laughs> <laughs> Has that shit changed dramatically since you got to the New York Times? Um, just like just the sh- I don't know the over the over art. Does that really impact? I mean, I, I don't know. Tell us tell us about has work changed dramatically since the election? I mean, not on like a day to day basis, other than the fact that politics drowns everything else out like there's so much bad shit happening in the world that isn't getting the attention it deserves because all eyes are on trump Um, right and it'd be nice if that wasn't the case but you know the the job itself hasn't really changed like we've we've beefed up our security at the times because the you know there, there are more um people who are mad about the the existence of a free press. Um, so there's little things like that, but you know, not really. That sucks. That does suck. Yeah. Yeah. I don't yeah, think there's a lot of things that suck. Yeah. No, nobody. I mean, actually, they, I guess maybe there are people who are not fond of my work. What with the, the finance and all, but nothing like that. That's, that's, yeah, that's, that's pretty unique. Like people aren't going on NRA TV and staring menacingly at the camera and saying, we're coming for you or anything like that. That is a, an experience that's more unique to, um, to the press. And does anybody do that for Jared Palmer Incorporated? <laughs> we're coming for you, Jared. <laughs> <laughs> you had to have burned someone in this trail of formic bullshit oh i mean 
There are definitely a couple people that have been like very pissed off with some things, but nothing like that. Not even close. Yeah, nobody's showing up at the WeWork, <laughs> knocking on the glass. We definitely had lawsuits here and there, but like that's that's just like doing business though. Like shit happens. Yeah, that's 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 the the cost of doing business. Like you know, people don't pay. They 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 don't know. It's just like. Yeah. Did you see that thing where it was a thing where every day past like whatever the uh, the net pay date was, the fucking site opacity drops by one. Oh, that was so good. <laughs> I love that. What was that called? Holy shit. Well, that was at the top of GitHub. It was so fucking brilliant. I forget, but that was amazing. <laughs> it was amazing. It's a fucking dick move and I love the <laughs> shit out of it. So funny too. <laughs> so what's your meme of the week, bitch? My meme of the week yeah. is a uh, Mark Dalgleish. Uh, telling people they should say better practices instead of best practices is definitely not a best practice. <laughs> I don't know. I would just got me. The other one, I think that was pretty funny. He retweeted it, but I'm just going to attribute it to him from Josh Johnson is just, have you seen the meme of like when I review my own code and it's like the old dude, he's just like smiling and six, there's like six versions of himself, just like with a cup of coffee. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Meme. That shit's so fucking funny. <laughs> That's a good meme. Rich, what about you? Do you have a meme of the week or tweet of the week? So this, this might be slightly gauche uh, to have a meme that was directed at me, but I'm going to read out a tweet. I am told Svelte.js is amenable for use in production, and I do know the author has a decency to pronounce out their language rather than masticate it as the other library authors seem to so enjoy. Still, its origins, Rich Harris's collaboration with that <laughs> dreadful rag, concern me. <laughs> right. It's the funniest account. Right. It's the best account. It's the best account on Twitter. Who is behind this thing? It it's is not, not me. It's not me either. And it's, it, it's, I wish it was me. I wish I was that clever. So for <laughs> anyone who like, it's clear hasn't there. come across this, this is Lord Kenneth Wheeler. Yeah, they, 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 they tried to throw, they tried to like throw shit towards, like, they tried to like throw the trail of, on me, like by mentioning <laughs> me this week and shit. Like they were like, and Jared Palmer, Jared Palmer, Jared Palmer. I was like, that's just not me. Like, no. Yeah, somebody was like, it's Jared. I was like, he's not that funny. <laughs> I'm not that funny. I'm not that smart. It, it's so funny. good. Like they've got the photoshopped <laughs> you like into a Chesterfield armchair or something. And so, do you <laughs> get more of those jokes than I do? Being good? <laughs> maybe I don't know. The the joke that I particularly like is if you go on the account and look at who it's following. Oh, that's what I was like, about to bring up. The Royal Opera House and the Lord's Royal Cricket. Ballet, Royal <laughs> Opera House, Lord's Cricket Ground. <laughs> so you need so, to help me figure out who the fuck this is. Like, so like as, as a Brit, like how accurate is this for? It's <laughs> got to be Oliver. It's got to be Oliver. That's my, that's my, he's that's denied my, it. Is a British person doing this? I mean, hard to say. It's hard to say. How would you know to follow, like, so what I don't understand is how would you know to follow the cricket ground if you weren't at least familiar with the British Commonwealth? I don't know. It's, it's a good point. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. We need, we need to dig into this thing, try and unmask them like they unmasked Host.js. That's what I was going to say. I was going to say my React Europe keynote. I tweeted the re my React Europe keynote shell is going to be um, unmasking Lord Kenneth Wheeler using machine learning, <laughs> just like they did with Horse.js or whatever. But what a, what, a, what a life goal, right, for, for you and me, Jared, to have such notoriety that someone creates a pitch perfect parody account. I know. <laughs> it's, good. it's really good. Um, I uh, I enjoy it personally. I think we were gonna on, on on the Yanni episode. We were talking about making the what is it Brent C Dogs account, which is the like <laughs> softcore porn version of Kent C Dodds. <laughs> Ken, we we mentioned Kent on here so much, and I wonder if he actually listens to it because like that last I don't one, think so, dude. I don't think so. A little racy for him. He Got said it was too mature. Oh, that was that was actually the, that was maybe the meme of the week. It was Ken Ken C Dodds being like, "This is what did he say?" He said like, "This is too mature. This is too racy, too mature, or something like <laughs> too mature for me." Oh gosh, love that guy. Nicest dude in the world. The fucking best guy. <laughs> but that was funny. <laughs> you were telling me you were in the car listening to the Yanni episode, and your your what did happen, Ken? Yeah, so I'm sitting there with my four year old, right, and my two year old. <laughs> two year old doesn't really speak English. Um, <laughs> And uh, we get to the point where we're talking about, like, you know, if we have, like, things that, like, we say to fuck with each other, because, you know, me and Yanni work together. So, like, do we have these, like, like go-to shit talks, right? And uh, at some point, I say, like, Yanni, Yanni is, like, something, something baby dick. And then my four-year-old is, like, 
my four year old has met Yanni, right? So Yanni came to our home and we all went out and had food and like had like a day, right? Like my kids know Yanni. And then she's like, Is that Yanni? I was like, Yeah, yeah, that's Yanni. And she's like, Yanni is a baby dick. <laughs> and I was like, Oh my God. I was like, I have to turn this shit off. Ugh, so and then immediately tell Yanni that a four year old said he has a baby dick. <laughs> I gotta watch this shit in the car now, and I don't even know what to listen to. Uh, brand like, safety. Like, yeah, like, <laughs> like, you know, this kid is gonna hear this shit. Like, I can't listen to like Fifty or Lloyd Banks or any of this shit. <laughs> I don't uh, even know what to listen to. I, 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 I put on like. Uh, what's I, the I, thing? Do 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 do. Baby shark. Yeah, baby shark. Oh my gosh! Oh, I put that Yo, back in my head. Baby oh, shark shit. fucking bumps, dude. <laughs> Yeah, when, when, when is the Ken Wheeler Baby Shark remix coming out? I'm just going to do one called Baby Glock. It's going to be like, Baby Glock. Doo, 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 doo. <laughs> but no, like, like I, um, so I just got a new Jeep, right? And it had, you got a new Jeep? The, the Alpine system in it. So it's got, a, it's got a little bump in its trunk. Yeah. And, um, like, we're in the car and my kids were like, Play Baby Shark. And I was like, I was like Hey, Siri, I had it on CarPlay. I'm like, Hey, Siri, play Baby Shark. And this shit fucking bumps. It's now like, it's, baby shark oh, fuck. Yeah, and then it's like, baby shark. Da, da. But like, <laughs> I have the sub like turned way up and it was like, it was like, mm, 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 mm. I was like, dude, I looked over my wife. Like, is this really where we're at in life right now? <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, Rich, what do you listen to? Do you listen to music when you code? Me? Are you uh yeah. sometimes sometimes yeah do you know uh my productivity tip is to listen to film soundtracks oh ken told me to do that yes. it's amazing because yeah. i i cannot listen to anything with lyrics and concentrate on what i'm doing precisely ken told me to listen to the i love your tweet that's maybe maybe that should be the meme of the week uh you, you told me once to listen to westworld soundtrack and it makes like making rectangles on screens make and lists make feel more <laughs> meaningful or something what, what did you say it was like that yeah, shit you feel like you're fucking launching a space shuttle or something only to realize you're just making rectangles. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> you're really doing something prolific. It's like, but yeah, the, the, the Westworld soundtrack is fucking... Oh, also the Social Network contra- um, soundtrack. That one's good. Halo. Halo. From Halo is six. fucking epic. Um, what, 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 what are your go-to soundtracks, Rich? Uh, anything by James Newton Howard. Okay, okay. He's done like... Uh, uh, who's Michael Clayton, Hunger Games, Waterworld, soundtracks like that, Hunt for Red October. Oh, no, no, that wasn't him. But these are all really good uh, soundtracks for feeling productive while you're typing angle brackets. Feeling heroic while you're typing angle brackets. Heroic, right? That's the thing. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes I listen to Harry Potter and feel like a wizard. <laughs> that works too. <laughs> I listen to um, the Stranger Things soundtrack. Oh, really? Yeah, I feel really good about it when I'm coding. I, I also sometimes will be like, I will just listen to, I'll just say Alexa play Kanye West and I'll just listen to, cause I know every Kanye song at this point. So it's not like new to me. No, shut the fuck up. No, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> Alexa, stop. Dude, dude, you see this, see this hoodie? Yeah, dude, the Wyoming hoodie it looks yeah, like. Yeah, so I'm in this, uh, I'm, I, I, oddly enough, I was in an aquarium earlier. Okay, uh, my kid, like the way the story's starting. I brought them to the aquarium, right? <laughs> So we're in the aquarium gift shop, right? And the, these two people are in there and they're like the fucking two whitest people on the face of the planet. Yeah, they have like like sandals and like fucking like snapbacks with a fish on them kind of shit. Like, and <laughs> they look over, like the guy, I hear him say something. He's like, he's like, is that Jackson Hole? <laughs> like the lady, and like, they go and they're like, they're like, hey, wow, Jackson Hole, that's fucking great. Oh yeah, it's like our favorite place ever. Oh, did you get that there? And I was like, no, this is actually like, uh, it's like a Kanye West, like, uh, album release party hoodie. And they're like, oh, that guy, huh? Oh, okay. Have a good day. <laughs> I, was like, <laughs> I was like, oh my God. Uh, yeah, it was good. Too, too funny. Just making people uncomfortable at the aquarium. <laughs> yes, what? there were sharks there. Yes, we sang Baby Shark. <laughs> What was your favorite? Uh, was was that the best part? The sharks? No, actually, this little cage with these little baby monkeys. I don't know what the fuck they're called, but they're like monkeys that are probably like the size of like a corona, and uh, 
<laughs> I like how that's how you measure things and sizes yeah. of alcohol. Yeah. Like, like everybody else would have been like, <laughs> would have been like, I don't know. It's like a foot long or I don't yeah, know, it's a foot tall. Hey, oh, it's like, it's the size of a Corona. <laughs> yeah, it's about a Corona high. It's right? all about your bearings, folks. It's all about your bearings. Rel- rel- relativism right there. Yeah, and they're fucking <laughs> hilarious, man. They jump around and shit. They're kind of, they're like so. Was huge. it like a lemur or like one of the small little fuckers? Yeah, it was like that. Yeah, it was that kind of thing. Like a fucking marmoset or some shit like that. I don't fucking know. I don't even know if that's an animal, what I just said. <laughs> I don't know if it is, but I'll go with it. I know that yeah, I was just okay. watching. Do you guys watch Our Planet? Yeah. On Netflix? Holy yeah. fuck, dude. Oh my gosh. All right. So I was watching Our Planet and it's with David Attenborough. It's on it's on Netflix. And I watched the I watched it all, and then I got to the final episode. And in the final episode, they talk about the Siberian tiger, which is apparently the hardest thing for them to film. And they had this this uh, videographer live in a hut in the middle of Siberia. I mean by hut, I mean this thing was six feet by eight feet for 70 days straight he'd only leave the hut like once a day and all he was doing was just looking for the tiger just sitting there just like waiting for the tigers to arrive <laughs> what <laughs> what <laughs> no what happened <laughs> come here come on a podcast you want to be on a podcast <laughs> she came to notify me about her sister screaming you were at the aquarium today weren't you that's fantastic. Remember the baby monkey? She was sweet, right? <laughs> sure was. What do you have there? Can you show everyone? This is a uh, this is from the gift shop that I was talking about. Yeah. This is a unicorn. All right, a unicorn toy. I'll hold it up. All right. Very cool. It. Look what happens. <laughs> it like prolapses. That's, it's it's a pooping unicorn. They're never too young to learn. All right, I have to go finish up my uh, my podcast. All right, I'll be up in a little bit. All right, on, on the prolapsing unicorn note, <laughs> let's uh, let's end this shit. Uh, so, Rich, how can people follow you? Twitter, Rich underscore Harris. If they want to follow Svelte, it's SvelteJS on Twitter. Um, that's about it. Dude, epic. Um, and uh, thanks so much for joining us, folks. I'm Jared Palmer. And I'm Ken Wheeler. Uh, and this has been the Undefined Podcast. Uh, for the latest updates, follow us on Twitter at the Undefined IO or check out our corner of the internet at undefined.fm. We'll see you next time. Fuck you. <laughs> Rich, uh, thanks again, man. Dude, thanks for hanging.